Now that's difficult. We can let the story stand or we can let it sink <laughs> or we can talk about it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but only one word. I mean, um, they're reading or um, the man is reading this book, you know, the extinction of uh, humanity on the plane and then later on and uh, bits and pieces that are quoted uh, by her in her mind. Now, there's a very clear uh, possibility of extinction, a double possibility of extinction, him and her. But, I mean, you said uh, background psychology? No, what did you say? Uh, shadow. Sh uh, shadow <laughs> psychology. <coughs> what does this possibility of death say about the relationship, about the world? I mean, there's, there's another story um, where there's the line, how easily inverted the world could be. And here we can see how easily, and in a sense, that goes for individuals as well as societies, how easily everybody uh, and everything can, can be uh, inverted. We have a very safe, secure uh, way of life. Tomorrow it could be quite different. But anyway, you tell us. Well, it's interesting that you, you pick up on the book as well, because obviously it's, there are a few things that are seeded in there, the bong that's left out. Of course, it has to be left out early on, so that it, you, you know, or taken out early on. But yeah, they're reading this book about extinction and, you know, not exactly worrying, but considering all the ways that things might end, you know, very dramatic things, volcanoes erupting. But actually, the, you know, the truth of the matter is for most people, it's going to be you left the bung out. You know, you ate too much fried food, that kind of thing. <laughs> so um, I, sp I suppose that's it. And it's this idea, again, of multiple layers of the story. You know, you have the grand uh, catastrophe <laughs> looming in the galaxy. And then the minor one, which, which, will, um, which will probably, in the end, see you off. Um, and playing out against this is the notion of sort of falling in love and sexuality, this sort of sexual impulse, you know, that, which is very biological on some level, this sort of, we must prevail, we must leave behind us our DNA or whatever or commemorate ourselves through our children. Um, so it's a sort of an existentialist story in a way. Um, and on some levels, the metaphors are very, very simple. You know, she's fallen in love. Uh, she's sort of realising this in an oblique way while, while kicking around in the deep water of the lake. So, you know, love, deep water. It's, a simple, it's very simple. It's very simple. But if you, if you, if you can kind of... Um, Draw the, reader, draw the reader to a realistic landscape then. You know, the metaphor's going to sort of work on some level, hopefully, and not seem too mm. banging over the head. Um, but what you said about <coughs> the desire to, to leave our DNA, etc. Um, I mean, in almost all of the stories, we humans are portrayed as some sort of uh, animal uh, yeah. type of being as well. I mean, for example, this housewife, if she's a housewife, uh, she finds out that her love life has become scentless and bloodless mm -hmm. and uh, then there's the story in South Africa and uh, again it's all very wild and very uh, animal like yeah that's very I suppose that's very interesting and uh, uh, it's a, again it's quite a simple way of creating drama these moments when the veneer of civilization is stripped off or, or something ruptures through and you, you know you, you you begin to act, or a character begins to act in an animalistic way in a feral way so in the, in the finished short story, she's, um, it's a very heroic act to sort of row out and try and find your lover because, you, you know, you're desperate to be with them. You don't think you're ever going to meet anybody like this again. And, but the question arises of, 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 of who's she, who she going to save, herself or the lover? I mean, very quickly, she sort of, the, the animal instinct to preserve the, the self kicks in, you know. She wants him to come and help her yeah. in, the, in, the, in the sort of submersing boat. Um, yeah, so often in these stories, something is rupturing through and, and, and people are behaving in a... We, you know, we like to think we've got control of everything and ourselves in particular because we're very refined beings now. But actually, particularly with sex, it's a sort of, you know, for, for, a, for a part of our lives, it's a, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's, it's glorious and elative thing, but at the same time, terrible and can lead to domestic rupture and, 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 and all sorts of things. And I, I am interested in that. I'm, mm. Again, being brought up in a very wild part of the country, I'm interested in how those aspects of the self uh, uh, may come to the fore as well and, and creating scenarios to allow that, even if it's just a glimmer of it, mm. a glimmer. A couple in Mozambique on holiday, the guy there decides he's not quite as into the, into the girl as he was and so they have a fight and she storms off, she's walking along the beach um, and she's tracked by a, a wild animal. She starts to panic that she's, you know, she, something's going to kill her and actually that doesn't happen and 
and she sort of in a way befriends, befri I won't tell you what oh. the animal is because it'll spoil it, but yeah. okay, dog, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a wild dog. Um, and it's walking with her down the beach and uh, something else happens off stage while this is going on. And I suppose these stories are in a way dealing with, if not the materialization of those red, red emotions and feelings that we have, then a secondary process, you know, the wish fulfillment. She's gonna have to kill this man off, at least in her mind, because he wants nothing more to do with her really. And in order to, to survive that heartbreak, you have, to, you have to sort of kill somebody off. And so there's a murder taking place. You know, this is a kind of secondary process, a subconscious thing. There is a murder or an attack happening off stage. Mm. Um, and that, that's a kind of witchy thing. It's a familiar thing. You know, you're sort of sending a spirit out. But, but I am interested in, in, in those sort of subterranean things that go on in, in, in people's emotional lives. Mm. Um, the story is called, uh, she, well, you read it, she murdered... Oh, she murdered mortal he. Yeah, because I don't know whether to uh, read it with a comma, she murdered, comma, mortal he, or more okay. like she murdered She'd mortal murder him. mortal he, yeah, he's mortal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it gets the title of a murder ballad, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Borrowed. And a now, Bob, Bob Dylan lyric. All right. Oh, I see. I wasn't aware of that. Um, listen, we have to open it to the floor in a moment, but uh, before we do that, I mean, you will have noticed that uh, in that uh, story that you read, um, there are quite uh, a number of intricate words, shall we call them. Um, in the first story um, that I already mentioned about this uh, family of gypsy stock, you used a different type of words, which are local dialect words. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about that and maybe read a very, very a small, you know, short passage of less than a page, otherwise we will offend the audience. Yeah. Um, because it's rich in that uh, vocabulary, which I'm sure is as difficult to understand, shall we say, uh, to a German, even though he or she might have perfect English. Mm. Um, well, and to an English person, actually, an English-speaking person. Sorry. And oh, difficult for an English-speaking yeah. person too, but the idea is that you use these words in the context of a sentence. They're going to make sense. You should have a, a sense of what that word means. It's never really being used to confuse. It's being used to enhance. It, you would hear it in, in dialogue in the north of England, possibly in older generations, but also in younger generations. These words are still in play, some of them less so. But, uh, but again, that I suppose I'm interested in the, the texture thing, yeah. of the word, the sound of the word, what it means, you know, the, the sort of uh, what it will allude to, the, the sensory quality of it again, you know, it's going to make you feel a certain way when you hear this word. It will have a physical effect, I think. You know, you hear it and these words can have a physical effect. And again, I think this comes from being brought up where I was. I was fascinated by the place names and some of the words that I myself didn't understand. You would hear these old Cumbrian farmers conversing uh, over a gate and it was like they were speaking a foreign language. You know, they were, they were counting in, in Cumbrian and they were talking about sheep in, in, using Cumbrian words and there was an odd English word that I could understand. Um, and I picked a lot of it up and I understood a lot of it and I used the words myself, but there was an exotic quality to it even then. It's a language that's falling out of use fast. Um, but, but there are English dialect words. Mm. They do not go back to, shall we say, old Cumbric, you know, like well, a... Well, you track Brythonic. some of them back to sort of Vikings, you know, yeah. some of them have kind of Celtic roots. So there is yeah. that, um, there's that combination always. Languages are very complicated. There have been sort of uh, waves of influence and new words brought in and the bastardization of words that, you know, calcs being used. Um, so there is that quality to it. Um, Shall I try and find yeah, some? As I say, uh, less than a page, yeah, otherwise we, we will get into trouble. Uh, I could just quickly... <clears throat> um. Or even just a sentence, you know. Or yeah, so, uh, I mean, there are things like lum pool, uh, lum. So it's describing the hood of a girl when she pulls her hood up. Um, there's a very kind of dark dark pool-like thing behind her, but a lum pool is a pool that you would dip sheep in. <laughs> you know, it's a kind of toxic, toxic solution of what did it used to be, whale oil and arsenic and things like that, that you would put the sheep in to get rid of the kind of pests. <laughs> so, but this girl is a very, um, she's a very hard-faced northern girl and she's actually full of a lot of dangerous stuff. So the idea is that this sort of pool of darkness that her hood creates is, you know, she herself is being immersed in it. So I'm using words like this, which are very, very specific, but actually, you know, will connote something else. They will have meaning for those particular characters and the scenario. This is at the beginning of a friendship between the main character of the story, Kathleen, 
and Manda, who is this fearsome uh, uh, a girl who kind of draws her into her family of horse breeders, and, and she gets into various various uh, kinds of trouble from then on. So that would just be one example. Let's okay, thank you very that. much. Listen now, um, you down there, would you like to ask questions or make comments or criticize heavily? <laughs> Um, we, we've had this discussion before at previous British Council seminars. One thing I've never understood is why publishers have the idea that short stories are not commercial. Because it seems to me in an age of planes and trains and buses, and somebody mentioned yesterday on, on, on the Today programme, you've got to get everything to three minutes, that in a sense we are assigned by generation or generations. Couldn't somebody here talk to the um, publishers? Because <laughs> you've got fun some fantastic short story writers in yeah. Britain and you're one of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, perhaps somebody else in the, in the audience could maybe it's give po it. It's possibly a myth, m miss myth. You know, it's sort of something that you do hear occasionally from publishers and might be the idea of a collection of short stories um, n not being terribly lucrative. And you're right. You would think that the form itself is very... Um, uh, uh, consumable in this day and age, and podcasts as well. You know, if you just want a sort of 40 minute flash of something while you're cycling or going to work, it, it is perfect. And it might be that w maybe the idea of investment in a book that you've bought, you know, the, the, the sort of assumption that the general public wants to remain with characters for a long period of time and, and rest for a while but come back to them. You know, we're trained to like soap operas, so we want to come back to familiar characters and have an exper a longer experience with them. Short stories also do something to you. They haunt you, they disturb you often. It's a different reading experience. If you, if you don't like that particular experience, you know, a comedic short story is fine. Uh, but but the, they will leave you feeling a little bit sort of tr trembling and upset or thinking about something. And, you know, again, that's a particular... Uh, 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 that, that's, a, that's a particular thing that some readers want and a lot of readers, I think, don't want. You know, they want comfort and they want consolation and a happy ending and, you know, not necessarily the kind of vortex or, or, or claustrophobia that, that a story, particularly at the end, can create and leave you, leave you feeling. So I don't know whether it's the diet of the reader um, or it's an unfashionable form. It's fallen in, in, into sort of... <coughs> It's not really a bywater form in, in the UK. It's still, you know, it's still a powerful form and you are able to, um, to buy collections uh, uh, and publishers will put them out. But I think you would probably need a, a, a panel from the industry here to tell you exactly why they're not commissioning them, buying them, you know. Because for the authors, it is frustrating. You know, it is frustrating. If you, you may want to bring out another collection of short stories right after the collection you've just finished or as your next book and not, that's not going to go down very well. You've got to place a novel in between. So... And I mean, there are huge success stories of short stories. For example, in Germany, Judith Herrmann with 100,000 copies sold, you know? Yeah. Uh, and she has only ever written two collections, yeah. but yeah. she is a big name. So that's possible. Yeah, so it, is. I, I, it seems to be a sort of self fulfilling prophecy when publishers say, yep. mm, we won't touch it. But anyway, I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> well, it's only a, co a comment on what has been discussed. There are very few reputations built on exclusively on short story writing. Mm. You know, there were, you, you can cite a few, say Pritchard, uh, V.S. Pritchard, you yeah. know, or Mary Levin, the Irish writer. Yeah. But there are very few writers whose, William Trevor is may, maybe not, al although he al also writes novels. Yeah. But uh, a very few uh, reputations exclusively built on the publication of short stories. And some of that must have also entered the minds of the publishers, I assume. Yeah, That's I think. Not the entire explanation but there's something in it yeah I think um, I think that's certainly true as a writer you don't necessarily want to be corralled into using a certain form only uh, it might be that you that you have a certain uh, prowess or, or, or um, dexterity with 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 the short story or, or writing novels or poetry but lots of writers feel that you know various forms suit different uh, uh, modes of their own way of expressing themselves so why you know why wouldn't you want to uh, attempt the long form to tackle one subject and, and, and short forms for another. As, uh, Joe was reading poetry yesterday and, uh, and, and he's writing short stories and novels. So I think there is an <coughs> interest in various different forms and what they um, enable you to do as a writer. But it is a shame. It is a shame that there are so few uh, 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 writers known only for, 
for, for the short story um, because, as I said again, you know, it's a difficult form, and, and in a way, they're like formal poets, you know, lyrical poets. It's sort of God. It's so there are so few people that can do it so very well, um, and we should really be be looking to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, was it you first? Yeah. Well, they gave me the mic, okay. but you know, sorry, you I gave I him I the voice. So. Please do. <laughs> Therefore, stand you up. must ask a question. Oh, yep. got two, okay. Ah, I've got a question concerning the scene you um, read from the Carolan army. And it's, it's a pretty obvious question, I'm afraid. Um, and what about the gendering and this kind of proto-fascist aesthetics you work in there? You know, her eyes were so blue that you had to look away, and she was so determined and so on. So you, you create a kind of crossover between a, a hyper-feminized community, which you then militarize, and then take over via, via your rhetoric into, perhaps particularly to Germans, uh, unsettling territory. Mm, sorry so. about that. Yeah, also in northern, you know, the north of England, you see a lot of very blue-eyed uh, genes. So, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're creating a character like Jackie Nixon, on the one hand, she's grotesque, you know, and, and she, um, she, she's using grotesque methods of, of manipulating people politically. On the other hand, she is attractive and uh, she has those qualities and there is something appealing about her. So throughout the novel, I was having to sort of work, have her walk a wire, you know. she's, she's By the end of the novel, even, I, I think we can maybe establish that she, she has qualities of manipulation which are abhorrent and she lies. But at the same time, there's a certain glory in what she's doing. So right till the end of the novel, I wanted there... Largely because the character's sister, who is manipulated by her and turned into a soldier, adores her through to the end. She remains loyal. You know, she's a loyal foot soldier. So this is her report, and, and uh, you can see the sort of terrible, the terrible way in which she, you know, she has given herself up for this cause, this woman, and what does it mean? And, um, and yes, there are, there are kind of echoes throughout of, of awful political movements that have existed in the past, and, and, and um, you know, ones that are arising now even to a smaller degree but I think there are certain triggers that you want the reader to have you know there are certain references which will be uncomfortable but so it's meaningful. A suggestion there's gender and yeah. there's politics but there's no gender politics <laughs> there's gender politics no definitely um and the women you know the women up at the uh, up at the farm have debates all the time about what they should be for and what they believe in so you know some of them have been up there for a couple of decades and some some men followed them up too so you get this colony of husbands sort of not allowed at the main farm by Jackie Nixon but they're living in a kind of satellite farming community living off turnips basically which is you know sheep fodder um, and occasionally the women will visit them I see right so um, and meanwhile the women are debating and a couple of people have had children while they've been up at the farm girls can stay at the farm sons can't so the sons are sent off to live with the men after a certain point but these are debates that were going on in the, in the 70s, 60s and 70s maybe 70s predominantly about um, how you raise men differently you know these kind of hard end political debates that were happening I wanted to pick them up and you know it, it, again the, these are not my politics in the book it's sort of an experimental petri dish of politics you know all the things that we think we've got our head around you know is feminism still relevant? Is, is, are we in a post-feminist age? You know, all these things are being sort of talked about. And as I said yesterday, uh, particularly with this book, it may seem that the sort of political discourse is sitting towards the surface of the narrative, um, which isn't very fashionable. <laughs> but it's quite fun as a writer. It's quite fun. So long as you're never losing sight of the, the, the hyper-reality of the world you've created... Um, you know, you don't really want people to kind of br a reader to break away and think, oh, now we're going to just have a little debate about feminism. It's always relevant to the story, at least I hope it is, uh, because that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the sort of primal duty is to keep you in the story. Um, suspension of disbelief, I suppose, simple way of putting it. But it's all going on. I mean, it, all those fights and arguments are going on in the book. Could it just um, pass the... Oh, you have it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I had a similar question about the political content in the sense that I find it really intriguing that novels set in the future, whether nearby or far off, are almost <coughs> always very clearly also political novels or dystopian. I mean, it's, it implies almost this idea of, you know, how we, should we build this world? How should we organize our world? Um, and historical novels of a similar 
always necessary political charge in the sense, how, you know, how did we used to do these things? But is there, do you see a way to write political, politically charged stories or novels set in either an, a named era, such as the short story you just read, or even in a contemporary setting? Mm, it's difficult, isn't it, in a contemporary setting, because you're sort of experiencing it, and um, things can't be borne out, <laughs> really. Uh, and again, that's to do with the narrative frame. You know, if you, the arc has to be there, um, or the development has to be there, let's say. Um, but I feel like I'm on very thin ice. <laughs> I don't know if it's sort of just, I'm calling it political discourse, but it's just really an inquiry. I think all novels are, are an inquiry into a, a subject matter, and there are n n not necessarily a manifesto in this book at all, nor would I ever want to kind of write a novel that was a manifesto, more just a series of questions and scenarios and possibilities and um, downfalls, maybe, or errors. Or, um, But I was, at the time, I wasn't thinking about science fiction. I wasn't thinking about the sort of, legacy of British science fiction, which a lot of it is to do with the failure of technology and how, in the future, the failure of technology that we have now, and then where do we go from there, and uh, how our own mistakes are, are borne out. I think that's not a peculiarly British thing, but it is different, I'm going off track here, but it is slightly different, I think, to American science fiction, particularly films, where there's a kind of an external force attacking, and what do we do about that? You know, a lot of British science fiction seems concerned with what we've made ourselves and how that comes about. I mean, that's a very simple way of looking at science fiction, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I was aware, even though I wasn't thinking I'm writing a kind of futuristic dystopian, I was just writing a story which seemed uh, interesting to me, and you're not necessarily aware of all the things you're dealing with. In the edit, I think you become aware of all the things you've been dealing with on a political and social scale and, and how they're bearing out. I, I, was, I was aware that there was, something, there was going to be something divisive about this book, deliberately divisive, so, and it was reviewed in such a way, it was either abhorrent to people or, or brilliant to people, and n now I have women coming up and saying, fantastic book, I remember Green and Common, this is brilliant, you know, going back to that era, and great, but at the same time, you know, there, there are these sort of fascistic elements going on as well, which are, which are, which are terrible, and I'm from Cumbria, I talk about the landscape, amazing, beautiful, at the same time, it's a BMP stronghold, on the West Coast. You know, we've got these terrible movements coming about. I'm rambling now, and it's not really answering your question, but... And let's not forget, I mean, that in the beginning you described the dictatorship that has taken hold of Britain. Yeah. You know. But anyway, I think we have to wrap it up, um, because also I'm being blinded and I can't <laughs> see Sarah Hall anymore. <laughs> So I think uh, it's a quarter past, if, uh, as far as I know, and we have uh, had our one and a half hours, and I would like to thank you very, very much thank indeed, you. and also to you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.